A very good afternoon and good evening to all our participants that have joined us today. I'm Noel, your host for today's interesting session. And I'm sure that, you know, all your participants, all your friends, colleagues are going to join the session. So please do pass on a text on WhatsApp, on email as well, that the session is about to get started as well. It gives me great pleasure to inform all those who have joined the session for the very first time that Monster APAC and Emmy is now founded. Well, if you uh, look at founded, founded is a platform uh, that curates the path to possibilities for you to find exactly what you seek and be able to say founded. We want to be your trusted partner to enable and connect the right talent with the right opportunities through a data-driven approach that offers personalized and customized journeys for your job seekers and recruiters alike. Well, let me also tell you that uh, Recruit is an initiative by Founded, formerly Monster, APAC, and Emmy, to connect CEOs, CHROs, and leaders in the HR and talent acquisition space with HR and TA professionals through a series of webinar sessions. Well, let me take the privilege to introduce the topic. Welcome to Founded Recruit session number 16. And well, we have a very interesting topic for all of you. I understand that it is difficult for businesses to remain immune to the fast changing world. At times, CEOs, CHROs, and leaders in the HR and talent acquisition space find themselves in very difficult situations, as it is evident with the news of job cuts and layoffs in the recent past too. Is there a way employers can negate and the macroeconomic factors affecting their growth completely? I'd say no. Is there a way that they are better prepared? Well, certainly yes. With strategic workforce planning, it is possible to become strategic against being reactive in an ever-evolving work world. To talk more on this topic today, we have with us Mr. Narayanan Ramachandran, Head Talent Acquisition and Strategic Workforce Planning Human Resources, Abdul Latif Jameel. Well, Mr. Narayanan is an industry veteran with over two decades of experience in human capital. His forte lies in strategic workforce planning, integrated talent supply chain, including global talent acquisition, HR analytics, and intelligence, futuristic HR technology, and strategic HR business partnering too. Besides India, Mr. Narayanan has an experience of working in global talent markets such as Southeast Asia, Middle East, North and South Africa, Turkey, Central and Eastern Europe, Benelux, UK, US and to have you amidst us, sir. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noel. I, I hope um, you can hear me clearly and so the participants. Great. Just give me two seconds to put on my screen and then we can start. Um, I hope my screen is visible. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Please, and thank you for your time. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you, Noel. Um, okay. So good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, it's lovely meeting you in this forum. It's always great to share knowledge, hear thoughts, and get feedback across. So what I wanted to share with you over the next 30, 45 minutes or so is about my experience and how a concept called strategic workforce planning can actually help a lot of us move away from being more reactive and being a little bit more proactive, a um, lot more strategic to our business, right? HR um, in functions, most functions is always looked at being reactive. We are called in to solve a problem, to get uh, to a resolution of a problem and stuff like that. We don't get too much, much opportunity to be strategic. And here is one function that focuses entirely on being strategic and not being reactive. And that I thought is, is more important in today's world because you, you know we are all hearing about this book of right? Which is highly volatile, complex. There is a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity in the, in the market and our businesses are going through that day in and day out. What can we in HR do to support business and help them through this? That's where strategic workforce planning comes in, right? So strategic workforce planning is essential for, for today's world, right? In, in the book, our word, it's, it's literally essential because 
that's where you are able to connect the dots of various parts of the organization, not just within HR, but various parts of the organization. And you will probably get to see how we do that as we go along the slide, right? A successful workforce planning should build should be focusing on building an agile, diverse, and a technology-enabled workforce. In today's world, technology is an integral part of what we do today, and that's where we should we should be able to focus on leverage that. Um, we, you know, we all of us in HR, right? All companies and all of us in HR face a lot of these problems day in and day out, right? Um, in HR, you we have challenges with attrition, we have employees having burnouts, low morales, productivity is not great as a result of it. Um, and what happens as a result of it? The brand of our company in the market takes an impact, the productivity takes an impact, and there are so many other things, right? This is what we're trying to solve. And this is where we are focused most of our job today. Uh, and, and that's where we are supposed to be reactive. But if there is an opportunity to get away from this a little bit more, I'm not saying that that strategy workforce planning is a silver bullet and it solves all your problem. But if you can solve some of these problems by a little bit more strategic, that's where we can probably move up the curve, right? Again, just to um, just to kind of let you know, um, as you as you hear these thoughts and challenges and, and and concepts, you might have a lot of questions. Feel free to use the question and answer session. We will collect all these questions and towards the end of the session, we'll try and respond to all of them. I can try my, you know, share my thoughts and experiences around how some of these problems um, I have faced and what have been my actions in this point. So thank you so much for, you know, uh, giving us a wonderful brief altogether. I was just wanting to check if we can go ahead and, you know, uh, take a poll and, you know, being able to understand, you know, which industries are our participants working at at the moment. So uh, with your permission, may I run the poll, sir, at the moment to be able yes, to see? Yes, it'll yeah. be good to understand okay. about it. All right. Wonderful. So I'd request all our participants today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining with us. Uh, we're very grateful for all of you to, you know, take time and, you know, attend these sessions. It's always uh, going to be a value addition for all of us. So please do, you know, participate in this poll, which because it will give us a deeper perspective in terms of, you know, which industry you represent and also give us give our speaker for today uh, an understanding in terms of uh, what is the audience that we have uh, in terms of progressive approach as well. So. Uh, I'll I'll put it up for the next seven seconds before I uh, showcase you all of you the results as well. So I only see that 67 participants, 67% uh, of participants have taken the poll. I'd request all of you guys to please do uh, take the poll as well. All right. So I will end the poll at the moment and I'd like to share the results as well. And this is how the results look like. So we have a, a bigger chunk from the IT, ITES and the BPO industries as well, followed by banking, manufacturing, uh, education, energy, and then e-commerce, construction. So, you know, we have participants predominantly from every uh, sector as well, uh, Narayan sir. Fantastic. Very nice. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So I also wanted to, uh, you know, check and, uh, you know, take your permission if I can also uh, go ahead and run the second poll that we have for, for today. Yes. All right. So in which uh, we'd also be able to understand the function uh, that uh, they've been uh, from as well. So I'm uh, launching another poll, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in, in terms of understanding which function uh, are you in? Uh, do Is it workforce, talent acquisition, HR manager, employee engagement, or are you from the learning and development or the HR journalist as well? Because it will give us an idea uh, in, in, in terms of understanding our audience a little more better too. So I request all of you again to kindly participate uh, in this poll too. Thank you. I'll lock this poll in the next 10 seconds. So please hurry up and do take the poll. Thank you. All right, time to end the poll. And if I look at the results, well, well, well. Uh, talent acquisition is predominant, and then we also have followed by workforce, HR manager, and the HRBP employment engagement, and then performance management, followed by learning and development. Let me also share the results with our participants as well. So this is how the results look like. Uh, any thoughts on this, uh, Narayan sir? Very nice to hear, and, and there was a good representation both from a industry segment standpoint and from the various COEs, should I say, within the HR, HR uh, standpoint. So um that's where the strategy workforce planning sits it's trying to connect everybody in so it's, it's very very nice to see a, a diverse set of talent both from industry and from a role standpoint. all right absolutely thank you sir thank you so much over to you great thank you 
let me get back to the screen. Um, so uh, when we when we talk about uh, you know workforce planning, right, and when we talk about strategy workforce planning, we'll have to understand that not all types of plannings are strategic in nature, right? There are um, some plannings which are very fundamental, right? So that's, that's what I want to you know, spend a little bit more time on this slide, helping you understand how does strategy workforce planning sit in a typical, and I've used the pyramid notation because it's easy to understand. A lot of things that we do today is showcased on the pyramid structure, right? So most of the organizations, and I've seen a lot of us working in IT industry, and so we should have a, we should have a good process around workforce tracking. Where are your resources today? Where are they working? What's your current headcount? What is your expected joiners? What is your attrition? Maybe some idea of skills because it's predominantly IT. Um, maybe the industry is not so much, but something on skills, uh, that's what we work on. That's fundamental, that's workforce tracking. And we'll have to understand that that is the foundational or that provides the foundational data for you to do everything else, which is on top of the pyramid, right? Once you get that right and you have a fair amount of accuracy on that part, which is you know exactly where your headcount workforce is, which region, which region, where they are, what is sitting, which project, which client and all that stuff, then you have a very good idea of where your workforce is. Then you try and move up to the next part of the ladder, which is, can I now schedule these workforces for upcoming opportunities of my business? This is where you move away from being only HR to start looking at business. Where is the business coming in from? What kind of uh, forecast do I have for business? Near-term forecast, not very, very long-term, near-term forecast. Like you see on the right-hand side of the pyramid, weekly, monthly, max, quarterly forecast. You have some business coming in. What is the business coming in? Where is my resource? What are they getting ending? Again, in the IT world, you know your, your project assignments, you know when it's starting, when it's ending and all that. So you will have some end dates, you know what skills they are, what's new coming in. Can you start doing some kind of roasters, some kind of, um, and where do you see a gap so that you can go and tell uh, the person who are doing this, this role, strategy workforce planning or the workforce tracking role, can actually go and tell, hey, I think we'll have new demand coming up in the next quarter on these skills, which we don't have today, which I don't see anything on. You might want to focus on it so that you can become you know, more strategic and not getting reactive, not that the demand has signed up and then there is excessive pressure on you to do it. Or maybe to the learning and development team to say, hey, there are new skills coming up. He seems to be at the junior level based on need. Can we look at these set of folks near skills and train them across? And so the learning and development team is, is um, notified to see if they can uh, do a learning and development initiative to get that skill set. That's where you start to take baby steps towards being a little bit more strategic. Again, you have to get better at this. You should be better at your weekly forecast, at your monthly forecast, your quarterly forecast, your ability to predict what you need to turn, what you need to hire for, track back to them to see if they are absorbed in the organization, they are becoming productive, they are becoming capable uh, people to the organization. And you get a little better on this, right? And all of this, keep in mind, all of the stages has its own iteration and its maturity time. You can't just can't jump one to the other. You'll have to execute that stage, track it towards maturity, get comfortable on maturity, and then you move to the next, right? So let's say you finish that, and then you, and then you are in a slightly more strategic, and right? then you don't do manpower planning. When you do manpower planning, you're looking at the business for the year ahead. And if you see on the right hand side, talking about at least one to two years, but typically a, a year ahead. So let's say you are in, in December of 2022. You look at, uh, with the, you sit with the business and look at what is 2023 looking like for the business. Where are they looking to grow? How are they looking to grow? And what are the you know, headwinds that you're talking about? Noel gave a brief about macroeconomic challenges. There are geopolitical challenges. There are so many other headwinds that the business faces. Is. There are tailwinds that business faces as well, which they're looking to write. You as an HR or as a strategy workforce planner, look sit with business and understand what are they looking to do? What are their goals? What are they looking to achieve this year? And you try and understand how much of talent is going to impact that strategy, how much of talent you need, or you what kind of talent do you need to be able to realize that business goal? And you start planning ahead. So then you look at how much of this uh, talent that I need are going to come in through what channels. That becomes a little bit more manpower planning, where now you're not planning for a week or a month or a quarter, you're planning for a year or maybe even two years ahead. If your business cycles are a little bit more longer, and typically in case of, for example, uh, a manufacturing or other industry setup, your, in the, your business cycles are a little bit more longer. Um, even in banking industry, some of your business cycles, treasury cycles and all the stuff are a little bit more longer. So you might want to plan for a couple of years, not just one year, whereas IT could plan for a year on your basis. So looking at your industry that you're in, you look at whether you want to plan manpower for a year or a two. And again, you'll have to get mature into this. You have to understand how your business is growing, where you're able to, where the goal's right, where you're able to look at your talent strategy, did your talent strategy match the business goals, all that you will do only at the end of year one or year two, look back how your planning was actual happens, and then look at measuring. Once you've got this slide, and once you've got your foundational and your tactical, your tactical is your 
Workforce tracking, workforce tracking is your foundational and your other two are tactical ones. If you want to get that clear, then you start moving into the strategic layer. The strategic layer is where the workforce planning comes in and you have the skills for the future, right? Let me just. So when you get into the predictive layer, when you get into the strategic layer, you have to understand the minimum time that you require to do some of these activities is on a period of three to five years. So that's why if you see on the right hand side of the pyramid, the predictive time zone is actually increasing as you go up, where you started looking at current and then weekly, monthly, quarterly, max body year. As you start growing up, you look at a three to five year or five year plus horizon. That's more strategic. And that's where you work, even with the senior executives of organizations, you work with the board and see what's the board looking to do for the company in the next five years and how do you translate that back to talent needs. Again, keep in mind, we are not trying to do the work of the business. That's the board's responsibility, the CEO's responsibility. What we are looking to do in strategy workforce planning is translate all of that to talent needs. What kind of talent does my organization need to be able to meet the business goals? Again, I know it's a little bit long. Just, just hold it me for a couple of slides. You'll, you'll get to understand how this can translate. Right? The exact opposite is the other way around, right? Where you get from directional to be more granular, right? When you go down from that pyramid, that's why you see that uh, these, these downward arrow mark on that side of things, right? So again, just a quick one. Get your workforce tracking right. You, you should know exactly your headcount joiners and, and attrition and all that stuff. And then if you're already doing that um, and you have a good level of maturity, fantastic. Get on your operational planning. Try and see how you can do a little bit more planning, roastering of, of, of your talent that is required to meet your business goals, to meet your quarter-on-quarter -quarter business goals or your month-on-month -month business goals. Once you get a little bit more comfortable with it, your planning versus execution is more clear, your strategy is working right. Then you get on a manpower planning. Then you come back and say, what is the business goal for the next year? What kind of talent needs do I need to do it? And how can I get my talent needs coming in? Once that is done, then you move into strategy workforce planning. Strategy workforce planning encompasses a lot of things. Right? So let me just quickly get on to the, to the next slide that will tell you what the fundamental strategy workforce planning is. Basically, what is workforce planning trying to achieve? It's trying to achieve the right kind of people. When you say kind, it means size, scale, location and the shape. Shape is obviously the, again, I use the pyramid organization because that's what more or more of us, everybody's talking about, right? The pyramid organization, what, what size of, what should be a shape of pyramid? Pyramid is talking about span of control or even outsourcing versus insourcing, a lot of things coming up. But basically the fundamental of workforce planning is just to come back and say, how can I have, what should be the size of my organization to be able to meet my business goals? What kind of skills and competencies that my organization needs to have to be able to meet the goals and objectives? Where should my talent be? The talent-driven location strategy is coming out of workforce plan. And that is where, again, I know I, I saw a lot of people from this community are, are recruiters, right? We always talk about talent-driven location strategy, right? You have to come back and, and act as advisors to business saying, this skill that you need for the organization that you need in, this is the right location to get it, keeping the cost, the dependence of talent availability in the market and your ability to grow faster your location strategy. So this is my top location. If not, this is my second location or third location. Those kind of strategies come out of workforce planning, which, which talent equation people can do. And the shape. The shape is, like I said, the pyramid, the span of control, uh, the individual contributor versus people manager kind of roles, all that. Stuff. End of the day, if you get these four boxes right, the heart or the center of all of this is nothing but the right spec. Because that's where, as HR, as the entire function, we go back and tell to the business, to the CEO and to the board, saying, Whatever is your spend for the talent, that's the right spend because you've got all of the parameters right that needs to spend. And that's where we contribute max to the ROI, right, to the bottom line. And I'm sure, again, you know, in IT industry and even in banks as well, a significant portion of the business cost is people's cost. People's cost is salary and benefits. We have to get this right. If you don't get this right, then you're going to have a hugely skewed um, cost structure for the business. That's going to impact negatively business. That's where we come in. And that's where I, I continue to come back and say that we are strategic in nature as compared to being reactive, right? What are the, some benefits? I don't want to read out a slide, but it gives you visibility and control. That's the fundamental thing. It gives you visibility. It tells you where you are today. It tells you where you want to be. It also tells you what the gap is and how you're going to get it. For you to know how to get your gap is where the next few slides will come up, right? right? But if you look at the slightly smaller text in the middle of the, of the slide, right? You will see that strategy workforce planning is a process that enables Workforce management, it's management of existing workforce. It, it triggers to talent acquisition in terms of what they what we should hire and what we should not. We should look at um, talent-driven strategies. 
it sends a trigger to learning and development depending on where the business skills required on it tells what telling learning and development what skills to to develop or build for right it looks at organizational development in terms of performance management what skills should be performed what skills should not be recognized it gives you the entire direction towards organization development which is performance management in a lot of sense and it also gives you a strategy towards retention what you should lose what you should not lose some of you would have heard the terminology of good attrition versus bad attrition where does that input come from it comes from workforce planning because workforce planning tells you what skills is required for a company what skills are not based on it you can actually figure out if that retention if that retention is required or not or <coughs> for that matter are you, you know, do you have the right attrition or the wrong attrition if some skills you don't want and they are leaving that's good attrition and you don't want to replace them you might want to replace them with something else all that insights comes in from just the strategy that runs out of workforce plan and last but not the least the total rewards when you do all of these things you have to pay right right you have to pay for your talent the right kind of cost right traction strategies the right market percentile and all that stuff the total reward strategy is done by this what skills you need how does skills going to help you am i paying right for the skills so as you can see this is one function that binds everybody together it connects every every sub function or every coe with an hr together and it acts like a glue that connects everybody together to work towards the common business right fundamentally this is ensuring that the right people are there at the right place with the right skills and at the right time and cost flexibility is the key today in today's world in workers world flexibility is the key today. so we you must be wondering as to how do you do this strategy workforce planning right i got my first three layers right i do good workforce planning i do good operation planning i know my manpower planning but how do i do strategy workforce planning for people who are in those stages that this is exactly what i'm talking about you have an organization goal which is running about 3 to 5 years right some of these goals for us to understand it could be revenue of of some some billion dollars of market size right some percentage of remote versus hybrid workers which is relevant in today's world right there is the remote and the hybrid has come up especially as a pandemic some percentage of the market size these are all organizational goals long term goals you you know they will take 3 to 5 years to achieve then organizational goals are converted into business strategy when i say business strategy it becomes a little bit more closer right practical and business could mean different in different things if you are a conglomerate then every business is contributing to it but if you are one company and having multiple product lines or service lines that contributing revenue then every product line or service line will have its own strategy that's what i call as business so in that business what are your your growths what is your revenue quality what is your source of revenue what is your competition landscape looking like what are your market influencers all of these things give you an idea of what the workforce demand needs to be then as hr folks people who are running this role of workforce planning you try and convert all of that into talent needs and again i will show you a framework or methodology how it is done but the next stage is you try and convert all of that into talent needs for my business strategy to meet which is ultimately ensuring that my organic goals are met what is my business strategy coming in and for that business strategy what are my talent needs and when you have identified a talent needs there are typically three ways to build in your talent it's build borrow or buy so this is the 3b approach that you that you will hear um, mostly these are the terminologies but you might heard some terms but in workforce planning you have the three b's approach build buy and borrow build as it, as the name goes you are building talent that is where remember we talked about the organization development the performance management succession planning the cross skilling all of that stuff is building talent right when when recruitment does fresh grads it gets into the organization to be built talent right so all that is your build strategy then some of your strategies is borrow you would need as part of the business strategy you will analyze that certain skills are not required for long term i just need temporary capability to be able to get over the current state right so you do a borrow strategy for it i don't i'm not going to continuously recruit everybody right i'm just going to borrow them for some period in time get that capability get that product or that service finalized and then i know how to move on maybe it's going to get fully displaced all that stuff so when you look at borrow then you look at contingent workers or or the gig economy or in some countries you know you, you have fixed term employees that you can hire for so that's the borrow strategy you're borrowing a capability a skill or competency for a short period of time and the buy is the most simple one which is talent acquisition or you do mergers and acquisition or you form strategy go to go to market partnerships to be able to get that but essentially when you want to suit your talent needs you try and fit all of these talent needs what do i need into these three structures build borrow and buy once you do that build borrow and buy then your respond corresponding functions in the hrs are triggered across and you will see from here this not everything lies on 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 the talent acquisition function a lot relies on other functions as well to be able to get and coordinate together that's why again i'm saying strategy workforce planning acts as a glue or you can say it acts as the program management layer of encountering all of hr 
and providing that strategic value to the business. So that's what this role is all about. Now, again, like I know the poll said that a lot of you are, are uh, in, in uh, HR and in recruitment a lot. People. For recruiters, keep in mind that when you, when you are looking at talent, when you're getting a demand, don't, don't start working on the demand. I, I mean, a, a lot of your focus is towards what I have today and what I have to fulfill. I know there's a lot of pressure on it and there is no two ways about it. But spend at least 10% of your time, 15% of your time today sitting with business to understand where the business is going. And spend again that 10-15% of your time today to keep try working for what's the business required in the future, which is that, let's say, quarterly or yearly one across. That is where you start off. If you, if you don't start that at all, then you're forever being in catch-up mode, which are ever being in reactive mode. For you to start getting away from being reactive and move, start moving into the strategic layer, that is where it is. That, that's how you start doing it. That's how I started doing it. When you start talking to business a lot more, you understand business a lot more, you understand what goals do they have, what are they struggling to achieve, why are they struggling to achieve, what kind of talent are required, when do they require, and what cost do they require. And if I can spend my time a little bit trying to take care of today's needs, but also have an eye towards the future, then you start moving up the value chain towards being strategic. So that's one of the ways of, of, of doing, how do you get away being, being reactive into being proactive, how you can be a recruiter, but do parts of the roles of a strategic workforce planning person or a strategic workforce plan, right? So again, like I said, the last, uh, we talked about how do we do this strategy, right? And, and um, there are six stages. Again, there are, uh, these are, this is the broad framework. And you no, know, every of these stage is an ocean by itself, right? If I have to talk about how this is done, it's an ocean by itself. What I wanted to leave all of with you is, if you're interested in workforce planning for your organization, where do you start off? you start off by ensuring that you're able to complete some of these six stages. And what you see as those small texts below are nothing but leading questions that you should be driving as a workforce planner, a strategic workforce planner in your organization. So typically what I do is when, when a year is getting over or when the strategy is getting over, we call, I call on all the business leaders and we try and articulate on the business strategy because that's the first step. The first step is to articulate the business strategy, which means you need your no, if, if your board is there, board or your CEOs and your C-suite people to come back and tell you the number of slides that we saw, what is your business goal? What are your, no, what are your identification of business goals? What do you want to achieve? So articulating the business strategy, that is very important. <coughs> Once they have been able to articulate as a business strategy, and again, keep in mind, when you talk to the CEOs and C-suites, it'll all be vision statements. But as strategy workforce planners, it's your job to convert those vision statements into measurable outcomes. So you have to apply the SMART principle. And that's why I said, you'll have to do all of these as, as ideation sessions or, or hackathons or, or design uh, you know, thinking workshops kind of stuff. You have to do that way. There are multiple methodologies and frameworks to execute it. There are multiple tools and technology available to execute it. But the concept is the same. Articulate a business strategy in a way that, that becomes measurable, that becomes something that we can quantify. Once you do that, then for that, you have to understand what is your talent need. So it says model your future demand. When I say future demand, I'm talking about future demand for talent. What kind of talent do you need, right? For a, for me to achieve this, um, let's say a, a next billion or a, or a 20 percent increase in market cap, what kind of talent do we need? What kind of sales people do I need? What kind of delivery people do I need? What kind of support people do I need? What technologies I need to invest in? All of that stuff. So you model your future based on what information you have based on. Then once you have the model, it's very easy to do talent supply analysis. Because talent supplies are existing workforce. And again, there are so many tools and technologies that is available today, methodologies which can assess talent supply. What is your talent today? And, and look at what your talents and skills are. So you have the model of the talent for the future. You have analyzed your talent that you have in today. Then it's easy for you to do gap analysis, right? What, what is your talent today? And what is your gap based on the future? And that gap will move to the 3B strategy. So what you saw earlier, how do I get onto this? These are the steps that you get onto it. Once you know the gap, then you have your 3B strategy, which is your build by and borrow. And you know, and you will be able to know how much, so build will require a different time frame, borrow will require a different time frame to execute, uh, buy will require a different time frame to execute. You'll have to put all of that together as a strategic workforce planner, right? If you have to build an organization, build a capability, it might take six to nine months. If you have to borrow, it might take three to six months. If you have to buy in certain markets, it takes three to six months, depending on the skills. So you have to factor that timeline in and, and put your 3B strategy and plans to mitigate your 3B strategy. If some of those things goes well, then how do you how do you look at mitigation all of those things, right? Once you have this in the start stage, that's the most important stage in my opinion is governance. 
state six is simply in, in one word is governance, right? You have to implement, monitor, and when you govern, you will automatically find you. And that's why the concept of the agility or the, you know, or, or the continuous improvement capability, the PCO models and all that's from place, right? You continuously monitor how your plans are going on. One thing I'm sure most of you have realized by now is it's not a one-way journey, right? I would have loved to show this to you as a repeating circle, right? But it's, you'll have to do it repeatedly because what I do is once in every six months, I go back and sit with the business to understand, hey, this is the business strategy you said six months back. Is this still relevant? What has changed? Has anything changed? Has, a, has your impact, you know, there's been a different impact, especially in time of pandemic. When imagine ourselves in 2020, when nobody knew what the hell pandemic was and our business plans, everything was thrown out of the window. We had to go back to the business and say, hey, what is this new world? How much things are changing in? And when the things are changing, then everything changes. Then again, you'll have to do the model for the future. Again, you have to do a talent supply analysis. You have to do the gap. And then you have to re recalibrate your business, uh, your 3B strategy. So keep in mind, this is never a one time. You will have to continuously go back and realign yourself with the business because the business is based on market factors and factors that are macroeconomic in nature, geopolitical nature, so many other things to do that. So this is not a one-time effort. You continuously look at if you're doing strategy workforce planning, remember we said this is a three to five year time frame that you're looking at. So as a good example, once in six months is good enough for you to get the CEOs back onto the table and talk to them and say, hey, this is what you said as strategy. This is remaining the same. What has changed? What, what do you need, need me to defocus? What do you need me to focus depending on market? And that's where you continue to become a strategy. And that's where you continuously have an eye towards the future and not just towards what is in today, right? At the, you know, depending on wherever you are in the organization hierarchy, don't worry about this might look as if, hey, this is supposed to be sun at the C-suite level or the board level or the CHRO's level. Not really. Every person, my team of recruiters, I ask these people to do it at their level. Go and sit with your hiring manager and ask him what he's doing. Hey, what are you looking to do? What are, what are your goals for the year? What are you looking to get measured on? How can I help you meet your goals, which is the business goals? And you can scale this up at a CXO level. You can scale this down to, a, to the junior most recruiter on the team. So the size and scale will vary, but the concept remains the same. And when, when the junior most recruiter on the team is able to do this, that is when that person is going to be reactive to be a lot more proactive. So I'm a little conscious of time, so I'm going to try and move a little bit faster for the next few minutes. But feel free to again put your questions in the chat. We'll take it towards the uh, towards end of this. Right? So the six stages are important. And like I said, just the last point, these under these stages, you see those small text. Those are questions. Those are leading questions, probing questions that you do in a workshop, in a design thinking workshop or in a solution architecture workshop, that you get your stakeholders to think on these themes and then you arrive at. One critical um, point to take care of when you are looking at strategy workforce planning is <clears throat> when you do these workshops, everybody becomes too idealistic, too, too idealistic solutions in nature. It's our job to bring them back to reality. So you have to always apply the principle of SMART, being specific, measurable, attainable, the SMART principle you have to apply. So bring it back to measurable things when you measure, then it becomes that much more easier for you to look at what your strategy was designed. Right? So some of you in the organizations might be wondering, where do I even start? Or if I'm starting you know, a workforce, strategy workforce planning organization, what do I have to keep in mind? We understood the framework, we understood the concept, we have an approach in place, we know where to start off. What are the things that you have to work out for? So for my experiences, the key considerations when you're working in a, in a strategy workforce planning organization or even looking to start one, either one. These are the five key considerations that I look at you for, right? As first, we have, as workforce planners, we have to embrace agility. So even as workforce planners, as individuals, we have to embrace agility because that's what is demanding in this book of world today. Just because there's so much of volatility and, and ambiguity, we have to be agile. We can't say that my, that my strategy or my, or my process or my execution style is all cast in stone. Doesn't work. So we have to embrace agility as an individual, as a role holder, as a leader, whatever way you are in, right? You have to embrace agility. The second most important thing is fostering a learning culture, because not everything you, you know and not everything you can buy. So you have to learn a lot. The entire organization has to learn. So that's where we talk about learning development sitting in here. In fact, as part of my strategy workforce planning organization, I have somebody who's focused on learning and development, who's a learning and development COE specialist who works with me because Continuously, not just within the team and organization, within my team, our job is to continuously learn, where we go and share knowledge, get knowledge, participate in events. Learning culture is very important, right? And again, I, we need, I, I did not emphasize, but then we all know how diverse inclusion can really help getting us ideas, thoughts, approaches from a very diverse world. So never have too many of one in a team, 
then it it stops your your ability to get things. So focus on diversity. Get a diverse team in, and when you have a diverse team in, when you have an agile agile environment or agile culture in, and you have a learning culture, believe me, the ideas will be great. Look at it. And like I said earlier, in today's world, you can do a lot more of these jobs easier and better by leveraging technology. Right. I I know some of us are a little bit more comfortable with no with notepads and stick pads and all that stuff, which is great. But I think after the pandemic, a lot of us our our technology quotient has gone up. So we should leverage technology a lot more to do this. Um, I have learned in the pandemic how to do design thinking workshops or solution workshops. There are various tools to do design thinking workshops virtually, where you get people on. Imagine having people for six hours on a on a virtual call like this, holding their attention and getting those smart points. There are technology available for you to do that. <laughs> we should get to do that, right? And when you are writing this at whatever level, tell the your one of the key consideration is prioritize talent management. You no, know, there is always a drag towards. You will get to notice that it always drags towards profitability, cost, revenue, and all that stuff. It will get dragging in there because that's where the business is focused on, and that's the numbers that end up. So it is our job in HR or in workforce planning to continue to put talent as a priority on that. Yes, revenue is priority. Yes, cost is priority. Yes, profit is priority. That no doubts. But let's also take talent management as a priority, right? And that when you put in, then the entire concept of attract, retain, develop, everything comes in place, and then you'll have um, sponsorship towards it. If you try and do it alone or without this, then that becomes a little bit of challenge. You'll have a lot more internal selling to do before you before you can go across. So, some key considerations for you to look at when you're either setting up your workforce planning team or looking to improve your workforce planning team, or even as an individual when you're looking to do this role. Keep these considerations in mind so that you can become a good strategic person. End of the problem. Right. This is probably the last of the slides. After which, from a concept perspective, then I'll have some um, other market news to share across. This is an um, governance framework, an implementation and a governance framework on the entire talent supply chain. You again see the build, buy, and borrow approaches in here. But again, when you when you have to start somewhere or when you are somewhere in the middle, how do I bring in the element of integrated workforce management, element of strategic planning, so I can start somewhere and look at it? This is another framework that again I have personally used in some of my organizations. Look at it, right? You look at demands coming in. First thing is I used to start dividing. Hey, this is a very strategic demand or an operational demand. This is this demand is going is going to help meet my business, meet my media goals today and tomorrow. But it's not something that's going to be strategic in nature. So you start classifying your demands like that, and based on that demand, uh, which which you do, then you start looking at what should be your entire talent supply chain process. So. One, the one, the ones in the gray slides are your workforce planning or analysis areas. The one in the lighter colors are your fulfillment processes, which is your, which is your build, buy, and borrow process, right? And as a workforce planner or as an individual person, even no matter which function you are in, you put all of that together using the governance mechanism, right? And so this is, I thought, is a is a nice way for you to know where do you start up, or if you're already in doing bits and pieces of it, how to integrate all of that together to be able to get to to realize the value and the impact that you're on. Um, again, I just want to leave you with with some more curiosity that if you are interested to read through, these are some of the case studies that I found personally very interesting when I was reading through them. Some of these case studies are out in the open. I mean, all of them are in the open internet. You should be able to Google it for them, or or um, or feel free to ping me offline. I'll I'll try and share them with you. Some of the big organizations, Microsoft uh, launched strategy workforce planning almost ten years ago now, eight nine years ago now, right? And and if you go and and if you have colleagues from Microsoft uh, in this uh, on this call, they will realize that. Whatever I've told in there, they're already doing it, and maybe even slightly better. Um, that a lot of their their hiring decisions, their location strategies, their uh, the development strategies, their incentives, everything is towards is driven from strategy of first planning. Because for them, everything is skills, right? And that's an interesting case study. Again, if you let me know, I I can share with you some content around it. Uh, so it's just not IT. There are other organizations like uh, the reason I picked up Coca-Cola and Shell is very different industry. Everybody thinks that this is probably only working in IT industry, it may not be relevant for other industries, right? There are other industries that are relevant as well. Um, Coca, Coca Cola is a classic example, Shell is a classical example, and Shell actually implemented workforce planning for their drilling and distribution division, not even for their research services IT center, for their drilling and distribution division. What kind of talent do they need? What kind of engineers do you need? And in fact, they had gone one level where in critical markets where they're finding it difficult to hire talent, part of the strategy of workforce planning asked them to go and sign MOUs with universities where they can create talent. In terms of engineering, uh, oil drilling, design, or distribution kind of stuff, right? So they create talent, and and that will take time, right? That's why I said it's three to five years. So they are not looking at today and tomorrow, which is they will continue to uh, struggle or attract talent. But 
for them to not to be in there, three years from now, they started to create talent. When people start graduating out of colleges with the curriculum that they designed, then they have <coughs> engineers, the farmers, whatever to their core business. So it's just not an IT industry, it's an across. And even it's in government, the city of Calgary is a great example. When you're servicing people and if you are technically a non-profit organization, right? Then <laughs> the questions of profits and all that stuff go away. But about servicing the people because it's a city, it's, a, it's kind of a government that you have to work with. <clears throat> what kind of people do you need? How do you assess your talent? Are they people-centric? High levels of integrity and all that stuff. So all that come in place. And so this is a concept is not tuned to say, hey, this works well in IT industry. It may not work in my industry. It'll actually work everywhere else. The contextualization is where, as HR people, we come in because we look at it from people angle and try and bridge the gap or create the bridge between business and talent. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, um, I know I've talked a lot, but that was his last slides. I really want to thank you for your time, uh, for listening in. Uh, Noel, back to you. If there are questions, thoughts, we'll be happy to share. Them. Well, thank you so much, sir. Truly, truly appreciate that. And uh, uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, also check and also reckon to all the thoughts that you've mentioned, I guess, uh, very elaboratively mentioned. And, uh, you know, I guess our participants would be eager to also ask questions. And I guess I really like the way that, you know, you've uh, broken down, uh, you know, bits and pieces as well for us to, you know, go ahead and understand what exactly would uh, we would like to probably look at as well. So uh, before I, you know, go ahead and uh, share my screen, I also request all the participants to please, uh, you know, uh, ask any questions that you might have, please drop it in the chat box. Uh, I also had the seen amidst the session that a couple of people wanted to ask questions. So it's time that, you know, uh, it's what, their favorite time, right? So I'd like uh, all the participants to, you know, uh, go ahead and ask any questions that they might have as such. So uh, we have uh, questions popping in into the chat box as well. Let's see. All right. Uh, so there's a question in the chat box. Uh, and the participant asked us to, you know, you do explain about the 3B model. Okay, so like I said, the, the build, buy, and borrow approach, right? That's that's very simple, the world, right? So when, when a business needs a talent, not every talent needs to be bought from the market, which is talent acquisition. Everything doesn't have to come to recruiters straight. I know in some organizations, or at least I've had my share of work experience in the IT industry, right? When there is a demand, it comes straight to recruitment, right? It doesn't even get explored in other channels, right? That is where we'll have to go and work with our, uh, with our businesses and with, you know, and that's where I think the strategy of course planning organization, if they are present in, we have to bring them in or take somebody that role to say, hey, when you need a business, when you have a talent, right, what kind of talent it is, do I have this talent internally, either in your skills or trainable skills, how far the skills are trainable, or whether they're trainable or not, how long do you need them? Do you need them for the rest of your life? Or do you need them for the next five, six months for this project? When you analyze the talent, that's what I'm talking about workforce analysis, when you analyze the talent, then you will know, then you'll be able to recommend the business saying, hey, this talent demand that you need, should either be bought because you need them permanently or you need them. We don't have it internally, but you don't need it for a long time. So you go and do a borrow approach, which means you do contracting or you do fix it of employees or you do gig workers. If that work can be outsourced across, right? Or you have a near skill of, I have a person in a company who's almost there, who's 70% there or 60% there. The rest 40% of the skills we are not fitting in, but you need this talent demand, let's say three months from now. Is three months sufficient to train this person, to give that person the knowledge, you will get shadow on some activities and projects and all that stuff and get them that speed so that they can fit it. So everything doesn't have to come on. That's a very simple articulation of what your build, buy, and borrow approach is, right? You look at the demand and don't just straight jump in. That's where, again, we are being reactive in our minds. You get a demand, the straight we log on to some job portal and start looking at talent, right? We are not working our time on understanding the demand. Why did this demand come up? What are the demand attributes? How long it is required? Where it is required? Is it trainable, not trainable? All that stuff you understand, what are the near skills? What are the trainable skills? Then you look at what is the best strategy to fulfill the demand. That's where we have started looking at. And, and, and I, I have, for me personally, since I started off as a recruiter long ago, it's easy for me because I understand the market. I understand the skills very well. I understand the market. I know what skills are trainable, not trainable. We have a lot of information because we are recruiters, right? We do this day in and day out. So it's easy for us to look at the demand, ask these questions, and then educate the business. Bring in your colleague, bring in a learning development colleague, or bring in the business operations person say, hey, this is not long term. Why are we not looking at doing contracting or a gig worker? Why are you asking me to hire and increasing the cost for the company? Or you will hire and then six months later you will fire. That's a that's a bad thing for the company, not a good thing. Right? So you bring in your colleague from operations, you bring in a colleague from LD, you bring in your uh, no uh, your leadership talent, and 
and have this conversation with them and tell them that for fulfilling this talent out of these three Bs, maybe you no know, borrow the right approach or maybe build this approach. You have a person sitting in the organization, you know, he's going to get off this project in the next two, three weeks' time, and I don't see any allocation for him. Can you train this person? Is this, this skill is trainable? Can you train him and then get him, you no, know, uh, use them for the next upcoming projects you need on? That's where your conversation should start. And that's where one as a person, our mind stands, starts thinking towards strategy and, and outcomes, not being reactive, saying, okay, I have a son, now I have to put a person in that box. I hope I, hope I answer that question. True, that's absolutely. And additionally, I had uh, you know one more question. I know that you brilliantly explained about how uh, we need to you know understand the perspective and you know break it down as well. All hands on deck, right? So I also wanted to ask, how do employers go about you know workforce planning? Uh, you know, looks like you know it's on big companies are already implementing that. So what's your take on that? Before I go ahead and take a couple of questions. I, I, it's, a, it's a very good question because it depends on the organization's maturity and the ability to predict. If your businesses are so unpredictable that you can't talk about a three-year strategy or a five-year strategy, it's going to be very, very difficult. It's going to be that much harder for you to get onto the concept of strategy for planning your business, right? Or if your business cycles are too long, it's not even, for example, I'll, I'll take you an example in healthcare industry, what I've known of limited, right? Some of the healthcare trials are running for 10 years, 15 years. So it's the same work that you do repeated over time because there it's not new skill. You are testing that product's viability over a period of time. Time is a factor. It's not a business cycle, right? So in those kind of situations, your strategy workforce planning has to be very different, right? It's not a three-year, five-year cycle. It's about how do I sustain the skills and how is what are the disruptions coming in? In healthcare industry, also disruption came in because of technology. I'm sure you'll recall 10 years ago, clinical trials was done using humans and and whatever, right? Rats and mice and all that stuff. Today, clinical trials are happening using technology where they're able to simulate. So a clinical trials person that you required 15 years ago versus what you require today is very different. As talent acquisition people or HR people, we have to understand the difference and see how we need to look at your talent. That's why we can look at. So different industries are different ways of doing. It. You have to keep that. In. Absolutely, and I guess that reminds me to say that you know we could got to constantly evolve ourselves as well, uh, strategically and also. Uh, look at a certain approach that we are doing, try to walk backwards and try to re-engineer our approach as well. Thank you so much for that, sir. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of loads of questions also, you know, popping in the chat box. But, you know, I'd like to start off with asking uh, a question from our participant in terms of what are the obstacles that, uh, we, you know, we will have to overcome? How do we make sure that we are meeting all our goals as such? Yeah, see, what challenges will be in the ability of our business leaders and ability us to be able to look at future. Because everybody is so caught up in today's world to be able to respond back. There are pressures if you are, for example, even if you are a private limited company, there are pressures on the books in terms of cost, revenue, and all that stuff. And there is pressure on us to look at it solved today. In that environment, if you go and say, I need to understand your business plan three years from now, it's not going to be an easy conversation, right? Um, so those are your obstacles. Those are your challenges for your leaders to be able to think at it, right? To be able to help us with you. The other challenge is in running those sessions, those design thinking sessions. Okay, my business leaders are able to talk about strategy and all that stuff, right? But again, they will talk at a very high level. They will talk at a 50,000 feet level. To be able to bring them down to that smart principle of specific, measurable, attainable, that's a huge challenge to look at it. We have to be focused on, okay, you're saying market share of this person, right? What do you mean by this? Where are you today? And if you are at, let's say, 10% market share and you have an ambition to be 50% market share in three years, what are your immediate steps? What are you looking at it in the next six months? Can you break this down six months by six months? How are you going to measure it? Or if you're saying my profitability is only 10%, I'm looking to grow to 25% in the next three years. Great. What are your attributes of talent profitability? How is talent coming in? What kind of people do you need? So you have to break it down to become specific and measurable. Those are the two biggest challenges. If you solve these two problems, and if you're able to get a specific measurable outcome at every single stage, then it becomes easy, that much easy to know because you know what exactly your goal is. Once you make, make it specific and measurable, then you're crystal clear on the goal. No ambiguity because it's all probably numbers. Then to be able to go back and look at that numbers at a point in time to see how we are doing, which is real versus planned, that's simple to do. And that's how you keep a track of how you are doing your um, planning versus actions or your goals versus achievements in that way, right? And that's why I said the governance, right? The governance is essentially doing that. <clears throat> once in six months or once in three months when you publish your reports, you look at what was your plan, what did you agree on, where have you against your plan, how much have you completed, what numbers have you met? And you come back and re continue to rehire. 
Well, absolutely. And uh, I'd like to agree on, you know, something that you critically mentioned, especially to have governance on smart goals, because there are a lot of things that we'd want to experiment on, like, you know, try to, you know, probably do it. But then it also matters in terms of are we, you know, logically trying to analyze and uh, with due diligence, if you're able to, you know, project it in the right way possible. Also wanting to add on with a question in terms of, you know, who is in charge of initiating workforce planning in the organization? I see this as, you know, requiring a cross-functional approach and a team to make the decision. Uh, you know, what uh, are your thoughts on that, sir? Actually, strategic workforce planning is not a one-person organization or it's not a one skill. As you rightly said, Noel, it's, it's coming, it's putting a team together. In, you know, if you look at a strategic workforce planning organization that I have, that I have managed across, I've not run, I've managed across. We right. have project management, program management experts who are able to look at every every area of it and look at it, especially right. in the build by and borrow, right? Project management, program management experts. You obviously have learning and development COE guys. Mm -hmm. Then you have in some organizations, contracting is a different channel. Recruitment is a different channel. You have to bring them in. In some companies, even in recruitment, pressure hiring is a different channel. Experience hiring is a different channel. You'll have to bring all of them in. You have to bring HR business partners in because they have to do. You have to bring in, in some organizations, in, in our current business, in, in one part of the business, we run heavily on, on the psychometric of the people, the person's capability, not skills, capability and competency. So I have interventional psychologists part of my team to be able to look at continuously, look at the talent and say, are they improving on their personality? Because personality is going to define the outcome, nothing else, uh, especially in terms of. True that. So, uh, you know, I also wanted to check, you know, how does one implement SWP in a startup which lacks an L&D department and which also has a limited small workforce as such? So, see, you, if you are if you are not good on a particular department, that is where you have to get it right. Go back to the pyramid, right? The, the fundamentals. The fundamentals of workforce tracking is important. If any of that is lacking today, you can't implement a workforce planning because then you're doing strategy on a weak foundation. Right. If you think your L and D is not that great, we have to fix that problem first, because the build concept of workforce planning is entirely related to L and D. If you are saying that I need this talent and I can build this talent, if you don't have an L and D, then that strategy, no, falls flat. So if there are components of your current HR structure which is not great, fix that first before you get on this journey, because your fundamentals foundation is, is weak. Your your castle is not going to stay out. Absolutely. I guess the LAT team always has that value addition uh, in the organization as well in terms of, you know, uh, hosting those process enablement sessions and also versus a communication oriented session always, uh, you know, has an edge towards uh, progressive approach as well. So uh, also in terms of, you know, workforce uh, uh, planning as such, uh, I also wanted to check, you know, how prepared are Indian organizations or, you know, uh, you know, do we do we have to probably delve into something else or uh, are we currently ready as such no again it depends on when you say indian organizations it's, it depends on industry to industry right there are if you go to the it industry i would say they're doing a lot of these things much much better and a lot of organizations that i know are doing very good strategy workforce planning some of them have a very strong foothold in the future of work as well they're able to articulate what kind of future they require all this stuff so that is it. if you look at banks i mean if you look at international banks in india versus indian banks that is a significant gap. International banks have advanced have technology a lot more. They have global spread. And so they are far ahead, a little bit ahead as compared to the Indian banking industry. So if you go to manufacturing sector, again, if you look at um, high-tech manufacturing sector, they are very well ahead. They are very good in terms of understanding skills and competence in doing it. But um, not so high-tech manufacturing sector or commodity manufacturing sector is a different challenge. So you'll have to look at where your sector is and look at this framework and see where are you fitting the framework. You'll have to do a self-assessment where you are. You'll have to figure out what you're doing right in that pyramid. Whichever stage you are, then you know what is the next stage. So my objective was to tell you what is the overall pyramid looking like, what's the overall house looking like, and to tell you how to do a self-assessment. Where are you? On workforce tracking, on operational tracking, on manpower planning, where you are. What, you know where you are, you know what is the next stage. And for the next stage, the stages will help. That's that's how, you know, so you have to look at the company in specific, where you are. If it's a startup, then I think everything they're building in place. So they can put smaller components of this. The size and scale is not required. That's the biggest advantage in a startup, right? You're small, you're nimble. Agility is by given to you. So you don't, you don't focus about agility, right? It's, it's by nature. It's second nature being in a startup. So agility is already in there. Learning culture is all. What you want to focus on is your foundation. Are you able to get workforce metrics done? Are you able to do your operation planning done? To get that done, you get more. All right, absolutely. And uh, I guess it's important for us to also logically look at and also have a evaluation uh, together in terms of what <coughs> well and what's not. That's going to be very important for us as well. So uh, leaves us a question with how do we measure 
strategic workforce planning any any thoughts on that sorry you have, you have to repeat again my my internet drop no problem i was just wanting to check you know how do you measure strategic work measure so yeah. see, the measure is is a simple against your goals so um let's let's look at strategy workforce planning let's look at three year goals the business came and said that i want to achieve let's say one of your smart goals was i want to have x percent market share at the end of three years right now that x percent market share is three year strategy they would have told you how they want to reach what are your important milestones right i always give this analogy when you want to go from one place to the other right you have your you know you have your toll gates to reach to right i have to pass to this area i have to pass to this area i want to avoid this area because it will be traffic and i want to get in that destination you you plan the best route or or for example google maps is doing that to you right when you want to go from destination a to b it's telling you what's the best route to take right likewise when you have your overall objective which is your end destination you should also be looking at that's where the smart principle comes in you also look at what are your immediate milestones what is my 6 months goal what is my next 6 months goal what is my 18 months goal and you look at on that 6 months when you have come in have you performed against the goals and if your goals are measurable then that will tell you you let's say you wanted a 20% market share by end of 3 years your plan was by for the first 6 months i should have improved by let's say 1% you have to come back and say at the end of at the end of 6 months i improved by 1% if not something in your execution strategy went wrong because initially you will start off slow maybe in the next 6 months you said i will go up to 4% in market share did you go in there so that's where your goals are talked about and you have those smaller milestones and and which is leading to your bigger milestone it is not just that you have a you no know, bigger milestone saying okay i will be 20% market share end of 3 years and for the bit of 3 years you don't know what that is going on then most often than not at the end of 3 years you will find you have no way close to that number so way up front those smaller smaller milestones those toll gates are very important and that's where the 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 smart goals and the small measurable comes i guess i'd like to echo with that i where you know we definitely are in a world where you know we definitely look at a robust approach but then you know regular checkpoints toll gates are extremely extremely uh, crucial for us and uh, you know one of our participants from the uh, session also asked that you know they want to understand if startups or building workforce from scratch requires a uh, focus on different stages or if this strategical so approach startups needs to have be a slightly made. different challenge right startups are are looking at growing exponentially so if you look at the growth path the growth path is exponential so yeah. the biggest challenge for them is to understand the skills now startups are on two things if you have a product or a service right product the advantage is you know the skill sets you will know what skills and competencies require and you can start building to it services will keep changing because services has a market needs and when you are in services startup it's that much more difficult for you to look at what skills and competencies you need so you you can't get into a strategy work for planning for 3 years that's a business plan based on which you secured funding or whatever right that's a business plan you take that business plan and move it down year on year so the the startup founder would have given a 3 year business plan to a to a to a venture capitalist or to a seed investor right you take that business plan and start building it down saying okay if you have to achieve this because this is what we committed to our investor what am i going to do on year 1 or year 2 or what, what i'm going to do in the first 6 months next 6 months and year on thereafter again you build your smaller milestones and you work towards it but i see the biggest advantage in startup is everything is on a green field you know large organizations right if you want to do this or if you want to even change it it's a large monolithic organization it's got its own baggage but in a startup everything is green field you can do whatever you want if you got the concepts right and you put in the right plug in ones it's that much more easier to do as compared to a large monolithic organization You're right and always reminds us about the startups that are still day one and uh, you know that's yeah. where they need to start off with yeah. uh, keeping all the fields in green Yeah. So you know how can uh, you know someone make sure that employee needs are aligned with uh, business objectives? That's where you, when you, when you have your business goals coming in again. That, that's that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing it up to the person. You have the business goals and you have the talent needs, right? You have to translate that to individual goals. That's where the uh, the HR business partners come in, and that's where they come in, or the performance management team comes in as part of the strategy workforce planning. So you have the business goals, you have the organization goals, you have the budget. You have to translate all of that to individual performance goals, right? because it's a collection of end of the day it is a collection of individuals and their performances that is aggregating to meet a uh, business goals that is aggregating to meet a strategy goal over a period of time right individual performances so that bubble down approach needs to be clearly documented in right and there again there are very good methodologies available across uh, across the world you can look at it as to how to translate or or water down the the business objectives to you know people objectives to the uh, to the individual objectives there are you know methodology is available across which you can easily look at right and so the the chro for the organization will get it from the board 
Then the CHRO's job is to come back and say, hey, if I have to meet my top five goals, here is what learning and development has to do, here is what recruitment has to do, here is what workforce planning has to do, here is what performance management has to do, total robots has to do, and all that stuff. That's the breakdown, first level breakdown happens. Then those function leaders are now breaking it down their own individual team members. In combination benefit, somebody must be doing career architecture, somebody must be doing job evaluation. In recruitment, somebody must be doing campus recruitment versus uh, lateral recruitment versus contingent hiring or big, you know, or gig workers kind of stuff. You break it down to all of them. As, and when you break it out all of them, you tell them the measurable goals. What is, and the best performance or the best management style that I have seen till date is, everybody clearly knows what are they contributing to their overall goal, to the organization's overall goal. What am I? And if I don't do, what is their organization's impact? If I don't achieve my goal, the organization is going to tip by 1% or 0.5%. That's what they need to know. If that sort of transparency is in there, then everybody will, there's automatically motivation to go on. Because then you have also built in a reward and recognition system around that. If I build my goals, my organization goals are met, which means everybody gets happy and, and gets recognized. That's, that. that's the most important part. Yeah, I guess RNR uh, is one of the key aspects too. Yes, uh, that's what I'm saying. Strategy workforce planning is not one person. You have to bring in all diverse people into the team, form a team, form a yeah. committee, and that committee drives this initiative. Again, from your point of all hands on deck. Yes. Yes. So, you know, what COVID has changed or, you know, let us learn in today's scenario of talent acquisition, anything on that perspective uh, that you'd like um, to share? About? COVID has pushed, I mean, there is, there is a lot of benefit for recruiters today, at least in my work when I do talent acquisition day in and day out, right? My business today is able to look at, I'm, I can confidently ask the question saying, hey, do you, do you need this person in front of you day in and day out? Why can't this role be done remotely, right? And that's become a benefit to us because now I can look at global talent. I'm no longer restricted by a market. Right? I can look at global talent and bring in the best of the talent and the best of the cost to the business and until we can look at it. So that's that's a big benefit for us. But the, the downside is sometimes the managers are too ambitious that they think they can get the talent, they can manage remotely, but they don't know remote management. They're struggling. You know, they're used to seeing people working next together and or having coffee set conversations or, or lunch conversations and getting the work done. But today, it's a little bit more formal. You have set up meeting invites, get onto them, do review calls, more reviews maybe. And sometimes people look at it as micromanagement and, and some candidates don't want to do that, right? So it's a little different. The COVID has its own benefits and its own impact. But the way I look at it is it, for recruiters, it's given us the power to ask questions which otherwise we would have been struggling to ask, right? Why do you need this resource? No, why do you need it in here? Why can't you do it later on? Why can't you have remote? Is this required uh, for you to have an in-house? Can't you have a gig worker? Because pandemic had forced remote working and in almost all possible roles for over two years. People have learned and, and they use all these questions. That is the strength that we need to use to be able to get a little bit more strategic uh, to our business. Absolutely. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'd love to, you know, ask you more questions as well, because I love the energy that you have. And, uh, well, unfortunately, I'd say that, you know, we'd come uh, and say thank you so much, sir. Uh, I know that, you know, we are past time as well, but uh, we definitely wanted to thank you for such a fabulous session. I guess it was uh, very, very engaging and, you know, questions are still pouring in. However, in the interest of time, uh, we'd like to definitely have a, a version 2.0 of another session too, sometime soon. Happy to do that. And thank you so much for hosting me and having me. Uh, thanks to Founded for, for help, for giving this opportunity to share my thoughts and all this. The thank you once again. Sir. It was an honor hosting with you. Thanks thank you so much. Thank you. Take everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. All right. So just, uh, uh, you know, something that I'd like to also put across is the work model trends. And this is for all of you guys, you know, looking forward for understanding uh, how at the past year that, you know, IT sector being the top of the list offered 74% of the remote uh, job. So this is the work model trends that I want to talk about. Permanent temporary, which was posted online. The sector saw a drop in remote jobs and had a share of 58% of such jobs with a slight split though with remote and 35% hybrid with 23% being remote. So if you look at the year 2022, uh, hybrid was at a 40%, but then we are now at a 29%. And then remote is at an 18% in the year 2022, and we are at 11%. Well, so if you look at uh, the work from home pre-pandemic, we were at 8% and then work from home jobs during the pandemic is at a 72%. Well, for more content, this was brought to you by the Founded Insights Tracker. Well, uh, for more, please do join us in the next upcoming sessions as well. I'm sure that we'll have some amazing content for you as well. And well, it's time for us to uh, part ways at the moment. And please do take our feedback and it'll only help us get better, serve 
you guys better as well. So please take this survey to share your thoughts and feedback as well, because your opinion matters and it starts with you. Thank you so much. And I had a wonderful time hosting all of you amazing participants joining us. Uh, have a wonderful evening, wonderful night ahead. Thank you so much for uh, taking in time and putting in all those efforts to join in the session. I look forward to hosting you all again in another action packed session. So this is Noel signing off today. Take care of yourself and have a smashing week ahead. Thank you so much. Take care.